Okay, thank you everybody. Um, tonight we're going to talk about my presentation uh, with the uh, help of uh, Dr. Weidenball and Mrs. Bast and a number of other folks. Uh, we have uh, something we want to bring to the board this evening for um, information and see where uh, whether the board is something they would like to embrace, not embrace, etc. So I'm going to go through a presentation here for you. Uh, this is really relevant to policy 214, which is the class rank policy. And uh, on the board agenda tonight, you see where it talks student recognition. This would be a suggested, suggested um, name change to student recognition. So tonight we want to talk about, oops, so, so tonight I want to just give you, this is a slide, I apologize, there's a lot on here, but I just wanted to give a brief overview to the board of the timeline of this process that we've been going through. And I'll move quickly as I can uh, by trying to make sure I make all the points that we need to make. Um, so January a year ago, 2017, uh, we began the conversation of, um, of the possibility of eliminating class rank at the, uh, at the high school level, 9 through 12. Um, we re we uh, put a lot of time, energy, and reading and information research into this, this topic, and we shared that with the curriculum committee uh, before we actually even got to the meeting, and they had an opportunity to read and become educated on the process that we were proposing. From there, we had a special meeting um, that we didn't get to have in January. Time just eluded us and we didn't get to that. So we had a second curriculum committee meeting in February of 2017. Following that, I guess the bulk of the, what I want to stress is we did have student meetings with students in March and April of last year, 2017. We did have faculty meetings this year with a faculty group, a um, target group of faculty members, December of 2017, February of 2018. And we did have a parent meeting on uh, February 20th of 2018. The parent meeting was consisted of, I went to my house offices and I said, could you randomly choose parents from uh, your house office to be uh, a participant and uh, to become educated on the topic that we had at hand. A final review was to, uh, to the curriculum committee in March. Uh, I know Dr. Roach briefly mentioned this to the policy committee this past uh, meeting in, uh, in April and uh, tonight is the 16th since we're here. So that just gives you a little timeline of, of the, the process. So areas of focus throughout this, and this is the same presentation that we used with the students and with the, the faculty and with the, teach, uh, the parents. So there's really no so slight little alterations to a few of the slides, but basically it's the same, same presentation. So the areas of focus were college admissions, course selection, and stress. Um, so class rank, what is it? Class rank is a statistic that's derived of comparing students' GPA. So you can see uh, that's an example of one of our classes in recent years. That's the example between a number one and a number two student. So you can see the difference of um, how close they are from a number one to a number two on that first, that first piece there. Um, in a recent graduating class, another just example, we had 10 students who earned a 100 or higher GPA. How do you get higher than 100 GPA, you may be asking, because we have weighted grades. So uh, our, our course, our advanced placement and honors courses have extra weight applied to them. So that's how you would achieve higher than a 100. But in a recent class, we had 10 students who earned a 100 or higher GPA. And you can see the range of those 10 students just in that 100 level. Class rank is usually referred to by percentage, as you can see. You can see across, certainly read everything to you. At Springford, we report class rank on our student report card and transcripts at the end of the fourth, fourth marking period. So that's our current process that we follow. So class rank as a statistic, class rank could be a very valid statistic if students took, if a student took the same set of classes, the same set of teachers with equal weight, which we all know is not feasible, especially in a school of our size. The validity, the validity of using class rank to compare students among various school districts is non-existent. And um, I do have our college career coordinators with us this evening right here. I'm gonna rely on, um, uh, at least Tricia here a little bit here in a second to go over a couple of things. So basically, as I move forward, so what happened is in my job as a high school principal, you know, you pay attention to the playing field. You pay attention to what's happening. You pay attention to what's happening for our students. And we were seeing a trend across the country where students, uh, schools were eliminating class rank from their uh, policies and procedures. So we started looking into that. I did. I spent a lot of time with this, reading quite a bit of information. And I started looking at it and said, you know, from what I see and what I'm reading, I have a feeling that we may not be positioning our students in the best we, place we could have them heading into the, 
post-secondary uh, you know, opportunities. And that's really what piqued my interest, and that's really what led us to this point. I brought other people into the mix. I brought Mrs. Bass, Dr. Weidenball, some of my staff, uh, and we really started this process to say, where are we, and is this what's best for our students? So impacts on students. For some students, um, there is pressure to obtain a high class rank. There's conversations that say, hey, that's good pressure. Some people may vote that be good. You should have that pressure on you. Others uh, have a contrary belief to that. Regardless, there, are, there is situations where there's avoidance, avoidance of challenging classes at times. There's um, unwillingness to take academic intellectual uh, risks and loss of scholarships due to class ranks. So there's a multitude of things, a multitude of impacts that do occur to students in this process. So just looking again at the top, where's the top? In a small school, it's difficult to be in the top 15% of your class. Average class size 62, you can see it'd be number nine would be in the top 15%. In a high achieving class, this could mean a high GPA cutoff in the top 15%. And if you look, relatively small differences in GPAs can result in relatively large differences in class rank. Give you an example. This is just another example. If you look at the tenths, the hundreds, the thousandths of a point in a local high school, you can see 0.23 is the difference between one and 23rd ranked student. Pretty, pretty wide variance of the rank for those particular students. At Springford, just as an example, uh, 95 GPA or higher, this is 2016-17 this is data. So this would have been uh, last year's graduating class. So the senior class last year, we had 127 students graduate with a 95 GPA or higher. So at our honors banquet, which we all attend, we had 127 students and families there. Um, this year, right now, again, our, this is our biggest graduating class this year ever. We have 660 students that will be graduating this year. We have 163 students with a, one, with a 95 or G, higher GPA. So you could be ranked a, a 163rd in your class and have a, um, the, an um, distinguished honors graduating status. This gives you an idea there. <clears throat> So why consider the elimination of class rank? Few points up there, scholarship opportunities, class rank may hurt students in the, for the college admissions process, which is something that we really want to focus on this evening uh, in the presentation. And class rank is not, um, is not as important as course curriculum for most university admissions due to grade differentiation. So every high school has a different weighting scale. There's no two high schools that have the same scale. So at Springford, our weight that we apply to an advanced placement class is different from a Thacton or Phoenixville or North Allegheny or a school in California. Everybody does it different. So when you get to the college admissions process, they try to equal everything out. One of the, thing that, one of the things that has not been eliminated in many of these processes is the class rank issue. What happened was as schools began to drop class rank, the colleges were presented with a more difficult task to determine who's going to be their top students that they allow in. Students, schools that still, and this is what all the research, students that still uh, release a class rank, those student, those, um, that class rank is still used in many of the colleges' application process. So if, if you look at all the private schools in the area, well, actually, let me go through this. So i actually give you a better idea here. So if you look at national trends, reporting class rank is not actually standard practice which many people may think that it is. It's not. According to the National Association of College Admissions Counseling, 55% of schools uh, do not report a rank. Um, effect on college admissions. So you can see there are some issues up here that do affect college admissions. There are a number of things. Colleges are starting to look at a more holistic viewpoint of a, of a student, and they're being forced to do that because schools are not reporting class rank uh, in their, in their uh, profile. There is, there is um, indication from the readings that we've done that school districts that have eliminated class rank have found that more of their students have been admitted to competitive or highly selective schools. And again, because you get admitted to highly selective schools doesn't always mean you go there. There's other factors that come into place. But again, reviewing this information, being aware of this information, and in my position, and in our position, we felt that we want to make sure competitively that our students are at the at most advantageous position they could be at when they do make application to their post-secondary endeavors. This is a chart. I can make this PowerPoint available to everybody. There's, there's a, I don't think this laser is working here. Um, there is, if you look down there, class ranks on the left-hand column. I apologize, the slide's small. If you look down the left-hand column, you go across. Uh, in 2016, 
there was the class rank was you can see the weight that it carried in, in the college admissions process. I can show you that before. So so people ask, you know, one of the things is reduced uh, reduced use of class ranks. So not reporting class ranks becoming more common. So just to give us an idea, because I thought about this. I'm like, well, where is everybody else? Where are the schools in Pennsylvania I mean, compared to Springford? What's happening? So I went out and we started looking. So you can see the top 10 uh, SPP, and we use SPP as a, as a factor of where we stand, whether people agree or don't disagree. That's an area that we do look at. And we just looked and said, so what are the schools doing? Union Chads Ford, they do not rank. Upper St. Clair does not rank. Wissahickon, no rank, and you can see down the list. North Penn and Springford were two schools on that list that still to do report a class rank. And I will tell you, I know, I know for a fact that schools that do rank still are in a similar process that we are, and we can talk about that here in a minute. So here's an idea of area high, high ranking area schools. So just to get an idea. So if you look at the Central Bucks, the Council Rocks, the Downing Towns, Hapro Horsham, yes, Lower Marion, no. With Acton, PV, Perkyo and Valley, they've already been in touch with me numerous times. They're actually working through the process now as well as we are. So you can go down the list to see the, the schools that do not rank. Make a note at the bottom, some of the uh, schools that do not rank, they still rank, but they do not publish or share with the students. And the policy that we're proposing, we still would uh, compute a class rank. It just would not be public. It would not be administered to anyone. Um, the only way it would be distributed is if, for example, a student was uh, going to the military academy where they may still require class rank or uh, trying to achieve a scholarship where they're asking for class rank. So, for example, if, um, if um, Aaron's daughter was going to go to a school and was going to go to a scholarship, they say Mrs. Crew would have to give us notification where that would be sent and we could send that to a school so that they could have that information if it was deemed necessary. That just gives you examples. So that does give you a little idea of where we were. And I will tell you this, for me personally, I'm not trying to keep up with the Joneses and just do it because everybody else is doing it. I want to make sure that our kids, again, reiterating that our students are in the best position that they can be in moving forward. These are just some opinions on class rank for whatever they're worth. They're from some, some folks around the country, educational consultants um, around the country, just talks about the different factors that are included in a class rank, so opinion matters. Um, the NASSP, the National Association of Secondary Schools Principals, they just reported again that the growing trend is where 50% of high schools no longer rank. I didn't have it on the list there, but you'll notice there are no private schools that rank. So if you go to Malvern, Hill School, any of those schools, they are not ranking their students. And I, I flat out call them asking, you know, why don't you rank your students? They said, look, we're not going to take our class of 100 where we feel they're all equals and put them in a rank and have somebody be 100 and somebody be one. We're just not doing that to our students. So it's just a, um, information that we received when I asked around. So again, these are just some quotes and some excerpts from some of the research that we did. So we just wanted to give you a couple examples of how class rank has affected um, some of our students. So I have uh, one here that I wanted to share with you. And uh, these are just about two or three that are just randomly. And this is all the time. This isn't just now. This is all the time. So um, we had a student that, had, that applied to Pitt, was initially rejected from the honors program because class rank was considered if the school reported it, which we report. So because we have class rank, it's in our profile, we have to report it. We just can't randomly say, oh, we're not going to turn it in because we do rank. So that's how that works. <clears throat> so the student was, um, was rejected from the honors program because class rank was considered. The student met the SAT criteria, that was above 1450, had a high GPA and rigorous classes, a 98.5 GPA with full schedule of APs and honors classes, spanning six major classes per year, including seven advanced placement classes, four engineering classes, and all the remaining honors. Because class rank was reported, he fell into top 6% of our relatively high achieving school district, Springford, and thus failed to be in the top five as Pritt's criteria uh, required. For obvious reasons, um, when we were able to talk to the admissions officer, then the, per, the student was then permitted, was, was admitted to the honors program. But this was a hurdle and a hoop that we had to jump through that we would not have had to jump through if we did not report that class rank. So that's one example. And Trisha, I know, has one or two other examples she can share. 
So uh, most recently, we had a student who uh, came into the Future Planning Center and shared with us that although through his whole, most of his junior year and into his senior year, um, a recruiter had been telling him that he was going to be accepted to the college he had applied to. Uh, this student was a very high character. He was a student who had all A's and B's on his transcript. He was taking honors and AP courses. Again, it's um, a local small school, so it wasn't one of those very highly selective schools. Uh, the coach had told him he, that he shared the GPA and class rank, or I'm sorry, the GPA and SAT scores with the admission office. The admission office said he should be accepted, no problems. Uh, when we actually submitted his transcript, though, it did have his class rank on it, and he was denied because of his class rank. And it was a student who had pretty much set his sights on one school at that point because he felt very confident in getting through the admission process with that school and unfortunately um, was not granted admission. So at the very last minute, he was forced to really change his plans and look critically at other schools that he could be applying to. Um, so that's kind of heartbreaking. I, I did call the admission office. I was a little upset. Um, <laughs> I wanted to see what was going on there. And the uh, the admission director was very frank with me in saying that they cannot accept students who are in the bottom half of their class um, simply because as much as we like our, what is it, the SPP score, um, they also have a score to keep up with. And when they accept students in the bottom half of their class, they are um, they are taking points away for their own college ranking score, and that, of course, affects their future enrollment. So that's huge. I mean, in the bottom 50% of our class, we still have some very solid students. Uh, we also had a student last year. Uh, it's very easy when you're submitting counselor reports to accidentally miss the switch over to we rank versus not rank, and one of our counselors missed that little checkbox for one student. Um, that student had a very high GPA. Um, another student who applied to the same school had a lower GPA but still met the criteria for the honors program based on SAT score and um, I'm sorry I, I messed that story up so the student with the lower uh, GPA and SAT score got the scholarship and was admitted to the honors program the student with the higher GPA and SAT score was not offered that same scholarship and honors program opportunity because we listed that um, we ranked for the student with the higher GPA. So we were fortunate enough that that college rep actually called us to see if we could take it off of our form for the other student, which we did in that scenario, but that is not something that we really should be doing in the future. Um, but for that student's one situation, we wanted to make sure that they got that scholarship. So we see these stories happening over and over again. You know, the, the students at the very, very top, like one and f one through five, they may benefit from having that rank, but the rest of the students really don't. A lot of times we're seeing that it's hurting students more than anything else. Uh, we definitely are a rigorous high school. We regularly have uh, different college reps who are seeking us out. They wanna come to our college fairs. They wanna meet with our students. They're emailing us because they wanna go to lunch with us and talk to us about sending more students to them. So that's not the problem. The problem really is on the, the class rank side. Just, one, just wanted to take the opportunity to just share a few examples of situations that we've come across where we want to, uh, so which again pr pr prompted us to make sure that we're trying to make sure our students are in the best position they can. So again, this process included the parents, the students, the teachers. We talked about advantages, disadvantages, should we, shouldn't we. I want to be very frank, there were students on both sides of the fence. There was uh, parents, on, there's been parents on both sides of the fence uh, for a variety of reasons. But all in all, by largely, largely, it's been unanimous that we should move forward with this proposal. So um, that aside, just wanted to share that with you. Um, with that being said, there's another component to this process, and that component affects another piece of our um, graduating procedures. Traditionally at Springford, <clears throat> we have a Val Victorian salutatorian. Um, as most of you do know, the, the Val Victorian is, is uh, the person who finishes highest in the class and the person who is salutatorian finishes second in the class. At Springford, traditionally, uh, the students that would finish first and second are invited to be graduation speakers. That's been a tradition for years. Um, and that is something that we have had in place for years. Um, <clears throat> we are making a recommendation <clears throat> to consider a move to the LUD system versus the Springford tradition of Val Victorian salutatorian. salutatorian. <clears throat> and we'll tell you why we're, why we're promoting that. 
So the difference, and most of us are familiar with the college system, it's a tiered system that recognizes students for the rigor of their academic program as well as their success in the program. And what that looks like is the summa, the magna, and the cum laude honors. Okay, so if all of us went to college, we're familiar with that process that the college system uses. <clears throat> and again, we're, um, I'd like, to, oh, I, you may, depending on where you stand on this, but this is, we're not blazing a trail that no one's ever blazed here. This is you know, some, definitely what other schools have followed in, in many instances. So benefits of the Laud system, it emphasizes student competition against other schools, students, not Springford students against one another, removes risk of taking the most rigorous courses of fear of class rank impact. So we have students that literally absolutely will not take a class that's not honors, not weighted. They just won't take the class if it's not weighted, even if they don't particularly want the class because they want to make sure they get the weight so that helps their, their rank, some of the students. So <clears throat> that's just one example. It reduces the GPA game among students and motivates them challenge themselves academically. So our current honor system, if you get a, if you earn a 95 or above, which we showed you last year, 2017, 127 students earned distinguished honors. They had a 95 or above. Above at graduation, they wear the blue and gold cord, <clears throat> if you're familiar. If you were honors, you were 90 or above, you wore the gold cord. So the proposed breakpoints for the cords would be the summa cum laude would be 99 or above. So you may say, well, 99 or above. Go back to the previous slides we had where we're showing you our highest GPA of about 102 or 100, near 103. <clears throat> so right now we have about, traditionally we'll have 20 students in that range, about 20 students, give or take. And the second one would be the magnum cum laude, which would be 95 to 98, which would mirror our distinguished honors and then the cum laude, which would be the 90 above, which would mirror our current honors. <clears throat> the TBA is what color cord, what would be that different cord that the students would wear. So we're, we're not recognizing less students, we're recognizing the same number of students as far as the, the break points, but we are distinguishing that highest group of students out um, as, as the cum laude, <clears throat> or the summa cum laude. So selection of student speakers, this is another piece that I wanted to share with everybody in the audience and, and the board. So um, this, again, was through work with my colleagues in different school districts um, and how, how we are ro rolling with this process. So basically, right now, again, we recommend one or two, two people to be student speakers. So our recommendation would be that <clears throat> eligibility for a student speaker would be the summa cum laude and the magnum cum laude students. So this year, if we had that in place this year, we'd have 163 students eligible to be a student speaker. So you say, well, that's, that's too many students. I mean, how are you gonna pick two students to speak out of that? <clears throat> so from my colleagues across the county and the state, because I'm fortunate I've been in this position for a while, I get to speak to a lot of people. When I mentioned that we had recommended just using the SUMA, which was about 20 students, most everyone immediately said, that's not enough. You're not gonna be able to, it's not gonna work. You're gonna want more. So again, we're taking some guidance from some of our, my colleagues. So we'd have about 163, there'd be a process. So you'd have to be, make application to be a speaker and there would be a selection process. That selection process would be through a faculty panel, and that faculty panel, would students would have to turn in their speech, have their speech reviewed. There's a rubric in place that we have in place. This is all stuff that the curriculum committee has seen. Um, the rubric would be in place for the students to be chosen, and if they got chosen, if, basically if you got chosen off of the first round of your written component, then you'd have an opportunity to come in and you would be able to give it verbally. Um, to the panel as well, and then the final selection would be made for the first and uh, for the person that would give the farewell speech and the person that would give the welcome speech. <clears throat> so that's the basic premise of that of that process. Uh, that process would take a little bit of time. We would be starting that somewhere in February, as it is right now. We'll be meeting with students next week about the graduation speaker um, position. <clears throat> So again, we talked about the valedictorian, the salutatorian. We have a board down the hallway. It's a beautiful board that has valedictorian and salutatorian on it. We talked about that. Dr. Roach asked that question. What would we do with that? <clears throat> and um, we have a plan in place for that as well. So there's some things that we can do that uh, can handle those types of situations. So uh, I gave a lot of information in a short amount of time. And the amount of information that we've looked at over the course of the last two years is extensive. Um, so. I think I covered everything that I'd like to in a short amount of time. I just wanted to open it up to 